don't know if you've noticed, but I've uh, strategically sat myself in front of the Avid logo on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Nick Turner, Business Development Manager for Audio Technica, looking after Alan Heath Digital Consoles in the UK. Welcome to episode two of Talkback, a show about nothing in particular, a bit of tech, a bit of general audio chat, and a lot about delving into sound engineers' heads. Today, we're honoured to be talking to Mr. Benjamin Hammond, sound engineer for their stars, uh, currently working with Skunk and Nancy and Maisie Peters, uh, amongst others, but uh, with a list of clients over the years, including Don Broco at the drive-in, Florence and the Machine, Lawson, etc., etc., etc. Ben lives with his wife and one child, New York, has huge hands, and I was once told he's the third best sounding gig to go through Manchester Academy. Is that is is that fair enough? Uh, well, it's debatable from my end, but third I can deal with. Well, yeah, I remember telling you about this. It was Prince number one. <laughs> well, yeah. so oh. you know, if you, say, I, I can't remember who was second, and obviously, maybe I need to uh, get Jay to to let me know who that is. So, Jay Smith, if you're watching, uh, who was second? <laughs> right, um, and you have got large hands. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of hands that, that look like they should be digging holes in ditches. And uh, I mean, that is what I do in my off time, to be honest. My garden is full of holes. <laughs> well, talking of building work, um, so we should let everyone know what's been happening with you recently because uh, you've just taken on a unit. Um, yeah. good, ti- good timing, Ben. Yeah, excellent timing to be buying vehicles and taking on units and whatever. But, um, you know, no, nobody could have really... Nobody could have thought that this weird kind of plot of a really crap Channel 5 Thursday night B-list movie that we're in would happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's all slightly odd, but um, but yeah, you know, it's um, we've been doing the the rock tech thing um, for, for the last year or so, um, and it's an expansion from that, really. We outgrew the existing place that we were in. Um, so the idea is that we're putting together, um, you know, first and foremost warehousing for the gear but somewhere that's a um you know a, a fully spec'd out kind of production space um you know not massive we're not you know it's not an aircraft hangar but something that you could easily put you know an academy sized production in the right power in there and truss in the roof the whole place is draped you know um production office dressing rooms all that kind of stuff um and then but we're also i'm in the process of moving my studio there as well um, it, lo- it looks like it stopped off in your house. Well, well, this is kind of some of the gear, and then this is kind of Studio 2, and then Studio 1 is kind of all all stacked up in the corner of the warehouse at the moment, ready to go. Um, we were literally just started putting the first bricks in um, when all this happened, so it's a, a big old pause button at the moment. But, yeah, we'll get to the other side of it, bigger and better and stronger, and, uh, and yeah, and then I can start piling all my money into something else. <laughs> Obviously, the other thing that's uh, stopped at the minute is any kind of gig. So um, you were due to go out again with Skunk and Nancy. Um, obviously, working with Maisie Peters, uh, singer-songwriter. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've had, you know, we've lost that. We've lost Maisie. We've lost Wet, Wet, Wet. Um, you know, we're um, due, to, due to start with Placebo um, in June and at the moment. We're just kind of waiting, yeah, really. Like that, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 well, it's the whole industry, in it? You know, everybody's just kind of hanging on and hanging on and hanging on until it gets to a point where it's really obvious that it can't happen. Um, you know, so I, I, I get it, obviously, from, you know, from a, a promoter's point of view. You know, if, if you choose to pull the show, it's on you. Um, so, you know, they're obviously going to need to wait until it gets to a point where, you know, legally coming from the government or whatever, this really can't happen. And then obviously that means that they can kind of cover their own backs, which obviously is important. You know, we need to get out of the other side of this with promoters still being in business. Mm. But 
the unfortunate thing of that is there's a lot of people kind of sat about prepping and working on shows that really you know aren't going to happen it's a bit of a weird kind of hollow feeling but you kind of have to do it you know so it's it, it, it's weird you know I'm, I'm kind of solid to the end of the year with the placebo thing and then Maisie goes back out again and then we've got Skunk and Nancy for best part of three months at the end of the year and it's kind of all the dominoes are lined up and I'm just kind of every time the phone rings just knocking another one over and the start date's getting pushed further and further back but yeah you know it's it, it's a difficult one because obviously no one nobody can possibly have a clue when it's going to end and then even when it does how it picks itself back up again because you know I've, let's be honest it's going to be a while before you're going to be able to put 5,000 people in a sealed room together you know what I mean well um that's the doom and gloom bit over and done with yeah <laughs> um as we see you've got your studio there in your house i mean it's quite impressive uh spare bedroom setup uh so i'm, I'm liking it well i'm not allowed to, i'm not allowed to say anything bad about other manufacturers but yeah thanks um, for, yeah, thanks, um, thanks for sitting in front of an avid console. covering up the badge um it, it could be anything <laughs> <laughs> um right okay so uh how this works i've got a load of questions to ask you um some of them relevant to d live so um it's worth everyone knowing if they don't know already that you've been using d live for uh, ooh, it's about f- five four five years now since since, since the inception i i actually did the first ever show on a d live ever with me and uh, leon phillips with a uh, <laughs> We were, where were we? We were with Def Havana in Brighton and we'd been working on D Live and, you know, been I was very lucky to be involved in it with from the kind of development stage as well. And I think it kind of got to a point where we were really sick of sitting and looking at it going, this thing's going to sound great. So we thought, sod it, we'll do a gig with it. And I don't think PFL didn't work yet. Effects returns didn't work yet. Um, I don't think inserts were working yet. I don't think it would save. So we sound checked and we had a, a GLD sat next to it, a GLD or a DLive, uh, an iLive, I can't remember, um, with kind of an existing show file on and we split everything into both consoles. I line checked on the DLive and lay on line checked on the GLD and then we had two outputs of the DLive going into the GLD. So if the DLive went down, we could just open up the VCA, the DCAs on the, on the GLD um, and then we kind of finished sound check and then just kind of stood around this console all day because we couldn't save <laughs> anything. And we were on for like another 10 hours. So I think we're doing it in like we're holding shifts at front of the house. Um, so yeah, I, but it, I, and it was great. You know, I, I yeah, remember saying yeah. the first two minutes turning to Leon and just said, well, do you know what? You know, the show file on the GLD is 200 shows old and this already sounds like my gig. In fact, it sounds better. So I think that was, that was a really nice moment. Um, and then I actually have that console you don't mind taking a risk or two then no yeah it's the only way it's the only way that you get better and it's you know if it's the same as anything else if people aren't prepared to um you know you take a chance then how are we going to improve how products going to improve or you know i mean i used i life for years before that you know and was always that weird guy that turned up with a weird console and people were, what we brought that for and the amount of times i'd say people would just shut up and listen and we'll chat at the end of the night you know but I guarantee it won't sound like you're thinking, you know. Um, but I like, you know, I like it. I like the fact it's a British brand. I like the fact that it was a bit of a underdog. It certainly isn't now. You know, it's it's pretty amazing what it's done. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm really proud of the, the the tiny little part I had in it. You know, so it's. Uh, but yeah, a long time. I've 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 no idea how long it's been now four or five years or something then I own multiple ones now as well and obviously the rock tech side of things we we are you know a very much a live SQ house so uh, first question first console mixed on or and owned the first I mean going right back to the beginning before I toured it would have been a soundcraft ghost um really uh, a studio yeah yeah well I so I um, used to play in bands, and my band, when I was in the, uh, in college, so I must have been, what, 17 or something, we, we signed a deal. Did it have we, a good name? Um, uh, probably not now. Um, it's, I, I, I won't mention it, but um, we, we, we signed a deal, and we I was really lucky, actually, um, finished my GCSEs or whatever, and, and then we went and lived in a studio in Hawkwind Studio in Wales, 
um, mm-hmm. for a few weeks and made a record with Chris Sangaridis, um, who did, you know, Black, well, he's not with us anymore, bless him, um, but, you know, did Black Sabbath and he did Painkiller by Judas Priest and he did all these kind of huge rock rock albums and we did it with him and uh, a guy called Russ Russell as well, who's a amazing, um, you know, kind of rock and metal engineer, producer. Uh, and I'd been, we've been doing like loads of demos at Shed 7 Studio in York, uh, the drummer from Shed 7 used to have a studio. Um, so I started, the more and more we went in there, the more and more I kind of started picking things up and then ended up doing my own sessions and starting to do my mates bands. And then I did the demos that got us signed. And then I kind of spent a, a few weeks in the studio with Chris and by the end of it, didn't want to be in a band anymore. I wanted to be a sound engineer. So, but yeah, I worked in a few studios, Randy, and they all had sound, every single one had the same Soundcraft Ghost, Mo2 2408 on Cubase. And that was it. Um, but sold a few of those in my time, yeah. Oh God, yeah, and they were all right. Um, <laughs> but live console was a weird one. I was, I kind of moved on in studio world, and I was um, one of the house engineers in a place called the Chairworks, just outside of Leeds. So we had by that time we had a, a forty-eight channel SSL G plus, uh, and we had a Neves VR upstairs, and um, I was making a record with a band who won a competition in Metal Hammer to open up for Slayer. Oh, so nice. it was, hey, do you want to come do that? So yeah, how hard it can be. So the first gig I ever mixed was on a D show. Oh, really? With the big old <laughs> expander um, <laughs> on a load of VDOSC um, in a very empty Manchester Apollo. And I imagine it was probably the worst thing to ever happen in the history of music because I think I just turned it up cripplingly loud to try and get over the big empty room. And it probably was... I think I'd cry if I heard it now, but um, yeah, that was a bit of a baptism of fire because it all happened really quick, as those yeah. things do. Yeah. So I was sat on, uh, I mean, God, this must have been 15 years ago, um, and I was sat on YouTube trying to find like instructional videos on how to use a, a D show, and you know, <laughs> but, um, but no, it was good fun, and then just, yeah, and never stopped from there. So yeah, studio would have been Soundcraft Ghost, um, but live would have been uh, a D show. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I, I've, I've seen the odd D show round in the last few years, but um, uh, they are kind of like one of those things that were for very special engineers normally, you know. So it's, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you had a sidecar, you were, you'd obviously made it, hadn't you? You know, profile. <laughs> yeah, I did. It was, it, it was pretty good that because then one of the very first tours I did was opening up for Dragon Force, oh. um, and. <laughs> Someone who's uh, who was uh, again unfortunately not with us, but someone who was a great friend and um, helped me out a lot in this was you know um, a, a, a very a very dear friend um, shirt who mixed Slipknot and Avenged Sevenfold and he was mixing Dragon Force and he was on a D show, um, so I kind of walked up thinking yeah great I know how to use this thing I'm going to be fine and then I remember hearing him just open up and thinking oh my god, <laughs> he, he, I mean he was. He was the best. There's nobody who could hold a candle to him. Um, well, uh, funny enough, one of the questions I uh, I have is is, is a, a sound out to uh, who helped learn you to engineer. You know, if that's English, who who was who was the who's the most influential person that has kind of like said right, you know, taking you under their wing and said, make this two sounds or, two or three again, kind of going back to studio world. Um, a, a gentleman called Richard Lacey, who was um, one of the other guys at the Chairworks, and we we just sat and mixed records together for months and months and months, and we never had anyone come in the studio. We just used to get sent records to mix and a ridiculous amount of gear. You know, we didn't have any plugins at all back then. The only plugin we had was AutoTune, and it was an SSL with all the you know the old school automation and all you know a ton of outboard gear. So putting a mix together was everybody like, you know, the big counter up on the screen and hands on buttons and knobs. And when it gets to that, you press that and everything was, you know, was done by hand. And we'd do 20 passes of one mix until we got that delay at the right place. And um, years and years later, he came out to a Def Havana gig when we were headlining Manchester Academy. Um, and it was one of those ones where you can't look at the desk because you're actually mixing this show. <laughs> because literally, I've taken everything you've ever taught me. And that that makes <laughs> every show I ever do. So I was too embarrassed to let him look at the desk because he'd have recognised everything. Um, but there was Rich and also a guy called Simon Humphrey there as well. Simon did the first Clash record. 
and he used to work with Steve Levine in the 80s at CBS and mm. he did all the culture club stuff and he worked with the Beach Boys and all sorts so between him and Richard I kind of really kind of honed my crafting studio world um, mm. and then as I say the, the kind of you know very very important person in the, the live side of things would have been Shirt you know he was uh, mm. always on hand to answer questions and things like that and he put me up for a lot of things and you know uh, was a, a a bit of a a bit of a mentor really um mm. which i was i was very lucky to have because he you know um in 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 my opinion he as i say was the best of the best and still is you know i don't think they'll uh, i don't think there'll ever be anybody who can do what he did yeah you know yeah um I, I i was lucky enough to tour with him quite a lot in various support acts and things like that and every night i'd just pack down as quick as i could and get to front of the house just to sit behind him and just hear it because there's just something when no matter how good your show was you come off thinking that you've got the absolute maximum you've got the best you can possibly get and then he came out and just pulled out another 90 percent on top of what you've done and it was just and i still don't know how it's one of those you can look at everything you can look at your show file and you can look at the eqs and you can look at its compression and you can look at everything as an engineer you know you can piece together mm -hmm. everything he's doing and but then you listen to it well, what the hell are you doing what are you doing different to me sick so you're obviously passionate about music, play drums. What kind of music are you into? Do you generally sort of like try and mix the genre? Uh, you know, you're into your rock. Uh, no, I, I think a lot of people, if the fans of the bands that I mix looked at my Spotify, I think they'd cry. Um, that a man with my music taste is in charge of how their favourite bands sound. Um, are you, are you I, allowed to tell us what's on your uh, run-up CD I, for Level 42, my favourite band of all time, always. Yeah. Um, a lot of older stuff like Earth, Wind and Fire, Doobie Brothers, ELO, um, but then more modern-y stuff, you know, Wolfpack at the moment, um, oh, okay. Ben Folds, um, Dave Matthews. Um, it's pretty diverse. Yeah, just anything that kind of makes you pull that face and nod your head. So I, I, I like funky stuff that makes you smile. That's not, that's not your sex face, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's difficult for acts these days because I think, you know, it does feel like there's this kind of existential angst that's sort of like hanging over everyone and no one's able to just produce a song that's just joyful. Um, and it's quite interesting that you choose all those artists and like, you know, a lot of them are just kind of not about dancing. Simple, but I don't want to listen to someone talking about shooting someone or about some ho or so. I, I just want, you know, what happened to like, Cool and the gang and singing about like how a lady's lovely or you know or just having a party or you know not that i do any of that i'm a miserable bastard and i sit at home sulking most of the time but you know i like to listen to other people having fun <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know music should be something that there's enough stuff in life to make you angry and to make you stressed and to make you upset or so why would i want to listen to music that makes me feel somber or uh, i want to listen to something that's happy music's supposed to be a release it's supposed to be something you enjoy mm. so i want to listen to something that you know I, I defy anyone to not listen to in the stone by earth wind and fire and not uncontrollably move some part of your body you know it's you can't and it's just something you know that kind of music just makes me happy and i like the fact that it's completely taken away from work yeah you yeah. know because i think there's always been that weird thing where if someone says you know you work for a band so do you like them it's like i honestly don't know because you look at their music in a different way yeah, yeah. and you know i've worked with bands who are before i got off of the gig I'm like, oh my god and then by the end of it you're still really into it but i think it would be the same if you're playing it because you're into what you're doing it's a different way of perceiving it. it's a different way of looking at it you know so um but i mean that there's that side of it and then the other side of my spotify is just playlists of all the bands i work with mm. and leading up to going out with the band i will just have the set list on repeat yeah. because the most important thing for me is understanding and knowing the music and knowing how it's put together and knowing what everybody in the band He's doing individually every one point so you can find that point that in any song whether it's a guitar riff or a vocal or a kick drum part or anything that's got hold of the audience and whether it's making them nod the head or whether it's making the hair stand up on the back of your neck or whatever there's one point there's one element in any given moment in time in any song 
that is the bit that connects you and what you're doing to the audience. Mm. You can do it. You can tell on a night when you've really got hold of them, and you can just knock something back. Yeah, and you see them dip, and you know there's that vocal, but you know the Skunk and Nancy's amazing for it because Skin's got the most staggering voice of anyone I've ever mixed ever, mm. and she's so delicate, and then all of a sudden she's so angry, mm. and you can just hold everybody in the venue there if yeah. So yeah. you just get a vocal right and just. And it's amazing. You can see, you know, as an engineer, you can see what you're doing. You can yeah. see how, or, you know, you are a massive part of the band's sound. You know, in front of us, you can wreck a show, absolutely wreck a show. You know, you mm. put everything together, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, we know the importance of what we do, you know. But it, it, well, it, no, it, I mean, it, I, I'll, I'll be yeah. honest with you. When I saw, because uh, I came down to see Skunk and Nancy at Rock City, Yes. Um, so yeah, I spent the evening with you there, and uh, and it's been a while, a good while since I've been to a gig where I've seen an audience just so up for it, you know, and and it was it was great to see the energy in the room, absolutely rammed, you know, it's and sh- everyone by the nuts. Yeah, you yeah. Not just you know that <laughs> you're you're involved in the gig. That's my biggest thing is it should be an experience it Mm. should be an immersive thing you don't go to a show to watch it over there and to hear it from over there if you do then stay at home and watch it on your tv Mm. you know i mean the the skunk thing we travel with a ton of extra subs and you know the band are super passionate that came with the band that was one of the things you know i i i I picked up that gig after you know rambo had been doing it for many 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 years um and it was one of the the things that the band had i mean i, I got re- i got recommended for skunk by john burton who makes his prodigy mm. and see they'd gone to him because of bottom end um and it, he couldn't do it and kind of passed it on to does me john know about bottom end does he <sighs> you should ask him do one of these with him he's a <laughs> live guy now uh, i might well, yeah yeah he is yeah well he did biffy Clyro, didn't he with um a d live yeah unfortunately he was supposed to do um the prodigy the american tour yeah, um, it never to happen. But it, it, I completely and utterly agree with that. You know, you, especially with modern noise limits now, the way you involve an audience is with subs. Mm. It's not crippling volume. It doesn't need to be crippling volume. And all these people that cry that you can't get a rock show at 100 dB, I'm sorry, but it's bollocks. Mm. You know, modern line array systems now, they they don't work like old speaker systems where you've got to drive them before they sound good. Mm. You know, you get the right mix on them. You know, and you can do that with your master and. Be, pretty much sounds the same obviously you know it doesn't with what the room's doing everything you but you know the, the how the how the actual speakers work you know and uh, you can use you can comfortably sit at a festival at 98 or whatever it may be and if you use bottom end right you can involve people and if they're feeling it then they're involved and they're surrounded by it and they're immersed in something and that for me, is the difference between going and watching a band saying, yeah, yeah, they were great, or going and watching a band and going, oh, my God, that was amazing, mm. because you're involved in it and the right light show that frames the band and that, again, you know, involves you and draws what you look, you know, and there's... the I'm, I'm a big believer, you know, people people really hang on production nowadays, you know. Mm. You know, years ago, it was like, oh, if you got the chance to see your favourite band in a sweaty little venue, oh, I can't wait for that. But then the business changed that everybody has to talk to make money, so if you've got, you know, I live in York, little city, there's not many people that go see shows. You maybe got on a Saturday night, I don't know, a thousand people will go see a show. Well, if there's one show, you'll get a thousand people. But now there's three or four, five, six, you know, whatever. Um, but you've still got the same amount of people buying tickets. Mm. So it kind of got to a point, you know, it's, it's levelling out a little bit now. But, you know, certainly in that kind of initial transition from, you know, the income stream from, music to, to live show and everybody was touring it got to a point where you could see a pretty big band in a shit hole seven nights a week if you wanted yeah and then what it actually became was that then people you know kids really wanted to go and see arena shows and go, oh my god and have their heads but and then you get like shows like muse and things like that which is just spectacular mm. they've taken it to the nth degree but that you know so i i think now again it's that kind of expectation and that kind of ex, mm-hmm. you know uh, perception from the audience of how a show should be and for me the success the successful bands and the successful shows that i'm involved with are those big huge immersive amazing things mm. so from a sonic point of view it all pins on bottom end so the mm. school thing's great because the band insist on 
we have to travel with subs no matter where we go. You so know? they didn't didn't sacrifice subs for video wall. Oh no, 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 no. no. they would. I, I think in that camp they would sacrifice. They'd sacrifice everything for subs. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but but they're, you know they're great guys. They all know about audio. They yeah. all they all produce. They all you know they have studios. They all they're really involved in gear, but not in that really annoying way where it means they're ramming stuff down your throat in a way that if you say, hey, we could try this, because that could, you know, oh, yeah, great, great. And they're really passionate about, you know, it's, it's a really fun camp to work for. And, mm. you know, they they really understand the little changes that you make and things like that. And it's um, it's a lot of fun. And it shows, their live shows, spectacular. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'm just... I'm, you know, I'm so excited to finally get to the other side of this and get back on the road with those guys. You know, well, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a funny thing because I was never a, a massive fan when I was a, a teenager, um, but um, having seen them, you know, I'd say to anyone, you know, if you want to see a show, go and see that. You know, you're gonna know you're gonna know the big hits and you're gonna sing along to them. But then, you know, it's it's worth going just for the for the rest of it as well. It's a proper you know, rock show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's no they're not hiding behind Pro Tools, they're not hiding behind Ableton, you know. There's a couple of little samples that are all triggered off an SPDS that I literally get on one stereo line that are very, very, very low. It's you know, it's people playing drums and playing amp guitars plugged into amplifiers. Yeah. 